Thank you very much, Marty, for taking the time to put together this presentation, part two of Building a Better Station. Nice to see everybody again. The, the whole purpose of this, particularly to help those folks who have had trouble communicating from their home stations other than through a repeater, and in some cases, even through a repeater. This series of training sessions is really designed to help you in what to do in order to have a station that other people can hear well. We've talked about kinds of antennas you can put up for different situations, how to select a feed line that isn't going to lose all your signal before it gets to where it's going. So here's what we want to do now. We want to route your antenna into the house safely, and we want to connect a transceiver and a suitable power supply, and we're going to cover those this evening. Thanks to Bill WE6SW, I was reminded that we do want to cover a safety item that is in the National Electrical Code. And it says, each conductor of a lead-in from an outdoor antenna shall be provided with a listed antenna discharge unit. Okay, an antenna discharge unit is something like this. The National Electrical Code is adopted by many jurisdictions, including the city of Los Angeles, as part of its overall building code. It is a requirement to prevent damage from lightning getting inside the house. The National Electrical Code also says the antenna discharge unit is to be located as near as practicable to the entrance of the conductors to the building and grounded in accordance with Section 810.21. Here's your house panel over on the right. There should be a ground rod. Uh, that is kind of the reference ground for electrical safety. Now, this is not the same as an RF ground. You see here the antenna and its lead-in are coming down to go into the house. At some point, there's a discharge unit, preferably outside the building if you can. And then there's a ground rod here and heavy gauge wire that goes to the existing house ground rod. So it's all tied together before it goes inside the building. Here's a single cable coming in. There's the ground rod. Here's a commercial clamp that's used. Here's that antenna discharge unit. This happens to be from Polyphaser. These things are typically rated for VHF and UHF up to several hundred watts. Uh, so they won't interfere with your signal. They have a very fast path to ground in the event they get a big current surge, such as you would have with a nearby lightning strike. And then it's weatherproofed and it goes back into the house from there. If you have multiple cables, it might look something like this. You have a ground bus, which goes to, goes to the ground rods and the house ground. You'd have an antenna discharge unit mounted in here, flange mounted, and then they would go from there into the rest of the house. The idea is that you don't want the only path for lightning to be down your antenna and into your equipment. Uh, that's pretty much a surefire recipe for having to buy new equipment and hopefully uh, not set the house on fire in the process. So you've got coax coming into the house. One other thing I should mention, let's go back to this drawing for a moment here. Whenever you bring cable into, uh, into the house, whether it's through a screen vent or whatever, you don't want a downward tilt to the cable coming into the house. You want to leave what's called a drip loop. So ideally it would come down and it would take a little like a question mark curve and then into the, into the building so that any rain that collects on the cable will go down to the bottom of that loop and drip to the ground before it goes inside the house so you're not leading moisture into the house. That's a pretty standard thing. Everybody does that and it's something you should all do. Hooking up your transceiver. Some of you have only a handheld. The question is, well, can I do it with just a handheld? And the answer is, yeah, kind of. Bear in mind there are a number of disadvantages to using just a handheld. First, you obviously is the low power output. These things are pretty much all five watts or less, and that's assuming a fully charged battery. The ergonomics are not what I call optimal. You've got to hold the weight of the radio in your hand, unless you have a speaker mic. The readout's fairly tiny. The controls are tiny. You, of course, have limited battery capacity. Now, there are some things you can do to try and alleviate some of these disadvantages. As far as power output, you can add an amplifier. There are amplifiers made specifically for handhelds, and they will take something from one to five watts and turn it into 25 to 30 watts. Now, in order to do that, the amplifier needs a power supply and, of course, a drive cable between the radio and the amplifier. So let me show you a couple of these amplifiers. On the left is a single band unit. That is, it works on two meters only. 
and you would have two connectors on the back, one for the antenna, one to the radio. You would have a power supply connection on the back. You would flip the thing on, and when you transmit, your couple of watts will turn into 25 or 30 watts going out the antenna. When you go back to receive, it will flow straight through back with very little loss. Some of these amplifiers are provided with a pre-amplifier for receive, so it actually boosts some of the receive signal. Usually, if your antenna is decent, you won't need that. And these particular models don't have it. The one on the bottom is dual band. You can put in two meters or 70 centimeters, and whatever you put in, that's what will come out the other side amplified. Notice we're talking uh, new prices, two to three hundred dollars here. You know, that's not necessarily an inexpensive way to go. Uh, as far as uh, having to hold the whole radio, you can use a speaker mic which means you're not carrying all that weight in your hand the whole time you're monitoring or talking. You do have to be a little careful with these plugs here. There are some radios, if this plug is not in all the way, it will short the radio out and cause it to stick in transmit. And uh, you have what's called a stuck mic problem. And usually the person doesn't know it, it's just they don't hear anything. They don't hear it because they're transmitting all the time. If you're going to use a speaker mic, make sure you have some means of visually or mechanically determining that it will stay completely plugged in. And for me at least, a pair of reading glasses is necessary if I want to see what's being read out on this little screen of the handheld. The batteries, we've heard people check into a net and they start talking and halfway through their battery runs down. First, if you're on a handheld, you really ought to keep your transmissions short. First, because people may have trouble hearing you in the first place. If you're noisy into the repeater, going into a monologue as to why you're noisy into the repeater is wasting everybody's time and getting them, frankly, a little upset. Keep your talking as short as possible. That will save your battery a little bit, and it will save everybody a lot of aggravation. You can power your radio from an external source. Now, make sure you look at the manual to see what it will take. Some radios run off other than a 12 volt supply. Most of them have a 12 volt input somewhere. And if they do, you can use something like this. So you have a small linear supply here or a switching supply which you plug into the wall and you run a cable with the appropriate connector going into your handheld. And now it's not using its built-in battery anymore. It's using this external supply. Another choice is a deep cycle battery. The one I'm showing on the right is a lithium iron phosphate battery, which is turning out to be the variety of choice for many reasons, which we'll discuss a little later. Deep cycle battery will allow you to run the thing down considerably uh, using most of its capacity. Certainly it would be in something like this. This happens to be 12 amp hours. That would be enough to run your handheld for several days, even if you're transmitting quite a bit. So now we've talked about some of the ways that you can you can use a handheld more effectively if that is all you've got for your station. Now, you know, you have a speaker mic hanging from your handheld, you have a drive cable, you have a power cable. Will it work? Yes, it'll work. Did you save money by accessorizing your handheld as opposed to getting a mobile radio? Not necessarily. And so there's really a preferred way. And when you look at our ACS Book 73, you'll see that we require members to eventually, after they've been around for a while, if they haven't done it already, to get a mobile class radio around 50 watts output. And that's what's gonna make your station play a lot better. In addition to having a, a higher output level, there are some other advantages. You've got larger readouts and the controls are easier to grab and adjust. You have a larger speaker, which means you have better audio. If you're using headphones, even better but even that larger speaker is generally gonna sound better than the speaker in a handheld. You only have to handle the microphone, not the whole radio. Because you're only doing that, there's less accidental bush button pushing, such as activating your wires on a Yesu handheld and so on. By the way, we do have a document in the group's IO that I put together showing on most Yesu radios how to disable that wires thing so that even if you push the wrong button, it doesn't come on and disrupt your transmissions. You have your choice of these radios. You can get a single band radio, which covers two meters only, or recommended a multi-band radio, one that will operate on at least two bands, two meters and 70 centimeters being the primary. Those dual band radios may receive one band at a time, such as the Yesu 
FT7900, which is what I have at the lower station here at home. It's a little inconvenient not to be able to monitor a second frequency, but it's also less distracting. You only have one place you're listening, one place you're transmitting. Many radios these days, the dual band radios, will allow you to listen to two places at once. You can see both on the Kenwood and on, on the, the ASU here, uh, you have a, one side of the radio on two meters, you have the other side on 70 centimeters. Usually you can actually have both sides on the same band if you want. If you have them split band, when you're transmitting on one, you can often hear on the other. So usually they will have one single antenna connection to go to a, a multi-band antenna. Some of them have the ability to disconnect the faceplate, which is kind of a cool thing. Uh, if you want the radio mounted separately and you'll have a limited amount of room, that's really designed for mobile. It does work uh, in some uh, home situations as well. You have some other neat things. You have backlighting that's always on because it's not wearing down a battery. You have a cooling fan or heat sink, which means the radio won't overheat when you're trying to transmit at the maximum power for which it was designed. That removable control head I just mentioned. You have quite a few memories. Uh, the single band radios tend to have around 100 memories. The multi band radios typically will be up as much as 1,000 memory channels. When you program your radios, it's a good idea to put them in logical groups so that you can quickly reach what you want to reach without having to dial through 1,000 memories, even if you have uh, that many in there. The radios typically have several selectable power levels, usually at least three, sometimes four. This will allow you to transmit with a power level that does the job, but not more than is needed to do the job. I usually recommend, especially if you have a radio that'll do 45 or 50 watts, that you not program your radio so that all the channels are on high power. Why is that? Well, first, if you end up having to run from a battery, it means you're gonna wear the battery down faster. If you end up transmitting a long time, you're going to be heating up all the components in that radio, and heat is the enemy of electronics. A radio transmitting at 25 watts is going to dissipate less power than a radio transmitting at 50 watts. Now, it won't be proportional, but it will be less. So it'll put a little less heat stress on everything. So when you program your radios, I suggest you pick a medium power level, and there's a button right usually on the front somewhere that you can quickly adjust. So if for some reason you just have to go up to a, uh, a higher power level, you push a button and you're there. Stored in memory is the lower power level, so next time you go back to that memory channel, it's going to set you at that moderate power level. So some of the transceivers we commonly used. Kenwood TMV71, very popular. It's what we have at uh, Fire Station 88 and at Old North Valley Station. We have the TM281, which is a single band radio. Yesu, the FT7900 I mentioned earlier, 8800 a dual bander, 8900 a quad bander. All of these are now out of production. You'll still find them on the used market and maybe even a few retail outlets that have some left. ICOM makes the, the 2730A and the ID4100. Alinco has their DR735. Bridgecom is a radio that I haven't used on two meters or 440, but they do have a, a 220 model for that band, which most manufacturers don't have anymore. So the Bridgecom is becoming one of the, the go-to radios for the 220 megahertz band. Since they have that radio fairly robustly designed, I'm going to assume for now that the two meter version is comparably robust. There are other models of radio out there. There are a number of clone radios where the manufacturer overseas who is making the radios for Kenwood or Yesu or whomever, and then they run a bunch more hardware and, and boards and, and chassis and so on, and they build basically the same radio under another name. Be aware that uh, not all radios perform the same, even though they cover the same frequency range. I tend to try to stick with radios whose quality is known and has been tested. If you're a member of ARRL, you can go to the league's website, ARRL.org. You can find reviews of many of these products done under laboratory conditions with comparative diagnostics, if you will, showing how these radios compare with their peers in a variety of, of characteristics and measurements, along with just text that describes the reviewer's observations and conclusions about that piece of equipment. There's also a 
really good site called eham, E-H-A-M dot net. And one of the things they have there is equipment reviews. And they are very, very thorough. I have posted quite a few reviews over the years. Friends of mine have posted them. Uh, some reviews are not very useful. They're, they're just, you know, great radio works fine. Others are very thoughtful and they go through and evaluate various features of the radio. Sometimes uh, a radio that may be fine to start out with has a reliability problem that will usually show up. And so there are categories of reviews. And then within the categories, you may find up to 100 or more different models and makes listed by manufacturer. Before you go and dig into a radio, I would usually go and look at the eHAM reviews and see what other users have to say about it. Uh, there may be only one or two reviews, there may be dozens, but it's a really good source to assess what the radio can and can't do and to help you determine how suitable it is for your particular purposes. Let's talk about powering your radio. If the AC power is on, AC power supplies, will give you pretty much what you need along the, as long as they are suitably sized. Your AC power can come from the public utilities or your solar system or a backup generator. If you have a suitably sized deep cycle battery, that can run the radio when the power is out as well as when the power is on. The power is on, you can always recharge the, re the battery. When the power is out, you still have some capacity there. And that's come in very handy in some power outages where I have a backup battery that'll run the radio for a while. Don't skimp on battery capacity, power supply size, or the wire that connects them. All these things have an impact on how effective your supply will be. Most AC power supplies really have two ratings. The one on the nameplate, the one that's in the model number, is an intermittent rating, ICAS. That means it will deliver that rating, maybe it's a 30 amp supply, it'll deliver 30 amps at maybe a 60% or 70% duty cycle. CCS is continuous commercial service. That rating is usually lower. A 30 amp supply may have a 20 or 22 amp continuous rating. A 20 amp supply may have a 13 or 14 amp continuous rating. So that continuous rating is always lower. Hopefully you're not leaving the mic on so long that you need that CCS rating, but be aware that if the radio takes 20 amps and you get a 20 amp supply, this would be typical, say, of a 100 watt radio, and you're transmitting a lot, it may start to heat up and get marginal. And you also have to remember that FM radios have a 100% duty cycle. As soon as you push the mic button, you are putting out 100% power, whether you're talking or not. FM and also some of the uh, digital modes same thing, as long as you're sending in those digital modes, it's 100%. The carrier is always on, always working full tilt at whatever power level you set. So the supply that you have and the cabling have to be able to handle that. So how much current does your radio draw? The easy answer is you look in the manual. Another is you can measure it, which is not that hard to do. Typical range from eight to 13 amps on transmit. You can look it up. And by the way, most of the manuals for these radios are available online, even if you don't own the radio. I have a whole bank of digital manuals for the radios I own and another whole bank of files containing manuals for radios I don't own, but other people own or that I might have to use in some situation. So I, put the, I have those all and I refer to them uh, not infrequently. For a typical VHF, UHF mobile radio that will draw on the order of 10, 12 amps. We recommend using a minimum 20 amp supply. Bigger is better. 20 amp supply is probably the minimum. I remember with uh, Jonathan visiting a uh, scout camp where they had a radio set up there and it was a 45 watt mobile radio. And he had, I think, a 10 or 12 amp switching supply. And he says, gee, every time I hit the transmit button, everything goes dark and it turns off. Well, yeah, because he had a supply that was not at all adequate for the radio. You don't want that to happen. Here are some power supplies that are commonly used and sold. Astron is a longtime manufacturer. The RS20, which is a, a, a non-metered supply, 20 amps. The RS35, these are linear supplies, means they have a transformer and filter capacitors, and they're kind of heavy. They're a little less efficient than switching supplies, but they're much more robust. That RS35 I have under my main desk up at the main station, I've had that for like 35 years. 
and I've never had to do anything except turn it on. There's my testament to that. The SS series is a means switching supply. Those are much smaller physically, they're lighter, they're more efficient. And generally, uh, these have been tested, they're pretty noise free. Switching supplies use basically transistors and they create their own AC, if you will, that gets converted down to the voltage you want. And in the process, they can be very noisy if they're not properly designed and filtered. These generally are quiet enough that they don't cause any problem. The switching supplies like the SS30 are the ones that I have taken for many years on my radio expeditions overseas because when you're putting everything into 50 pound airline bags, weight and size are both a consideration. Daiwa makes some good supplies. The SS330W is one. Jetstream, Samlex, and then there are some branded Yesu, Kenwood, ICOM, Alinko supplies that are made by others for them. And they all generally pass muster too. So again, look for a rating of 20 amps or more. Uh, there are used power supplies out there. I mean, you don't have to spend $150. You may find one at a better rate. And just a hint, Astron, which is located down in Orange County, will take pretty much any Astron supply you bring them if it's not working, and they will bring it back up to spec and repair it for a fairly nominal fee. I, I had two supplies that had bitten the dust, uh, I actually bought them used, and a couple of them were bad. I took them down there, and I think it was less than 50 bucks. They had them both back to new spec. So don't overlook that possibility. Now, a good deep cycle battery, they can deliver a lot of current. One now deceased Tam, who did a lot of research into this, told me that a, a deep cycle battery can deliver instantaneously 50 to 100 times its rated current, normally in the case of a short circuit. But uh, what it means is they're very robust in terms of delivering current. There's no lag. So a 100 amp hour AGM, which is absorbed glass mat battery, can provide 10 amps for at least eight hours or so. 10 amps is what, what you draw on transmit. You may only draw an amp or half an amp on receive, depending on the radio. Theoretically, a battery that size is fully charged, assuming you're only going to transmit maybe you know, 10, 15, 20% of the time, could run your radio for a couple of days. It would certainly be enough to check into your daily nets, but every couple of days you'd have to recharge it. Having an AC supply is much handier. I really recommend you have both eventually when you can get to it, because there are gonna be times when the power's out and you'd like to be able to operate. With lead acid batteries, and that would include the, the flooded type, uh, like is under most people's car hoods, AGM, absorbed glass mat, and the gelled electrolyte type. All of these have a discharge curve where the voltage drops considerably from fully charged to what they consider fully discharged. On most of these lead acid batteries, a nominal 12 volt battery starts out 13 volts and it will gradually discharge down to 10 and a half volts. 10 and a half is considered fully discharged. You go beyond that, you may damage the battery irreparably. You've got all this capacity that's being delivered at a lower and lower voltage as you go along. Many radios don't really work too well until once you get down below a certain voltage. I try to select radios that have a wide operating range. My little Elecraft K2s, which are HF radios, they'll operate down to uh, about 10 volts. My K3, which is my main HF radio, will operate down to about 11 and a half volts. I, ha I could make better use of this capacity than a lot of people where the radio stops working right at about 12 and a half volts. So look at this discharge curve. Let's assuming uh, the curves are parallel, but um, the lower curve is where you're char discharging it very quickly. You're using all its capacity in a couple of hours. The highest curve is the one where you're using the capacity slowly over time. But even if you use it slowly over time, here's, your, here's our 12 and a half volts. Where does it hit? That's at about 35% of capacity. So after you've used up about a third of the battery, the charge in the battery, the voltage may drop to the point where your radio won't function properly. You've got a lot of charge left, but you may not be able to use it well. If you have a handheld, most of those will operate at much lower voltages. My old Kenwoods will run on anything from 5 volts to 16 volts. I could put them on and run them for a week or two on something on a big battery like this. For comparison, I mentioned earlier the lithium iron phosphate or LiPo batteries. The lithium iron phosphate batteries have a different chemistry, and the discharge curve 
looks very different as you can see. It's almost flat and it starts out Typically, when I have these fully charged, they're running around 13.4, 13.3 volts. They don't drop below 12 and a half volts until about maybe 80 or 90% of the way through the discharge cycle, which means for the same 100 amp hour battery, instead of being able to use it for you know this much, I get to use it for this much, and it's going to run my radio a lot longer at full power. Now the disadvantage is that these batteries are much more expensive on a per amp hour basis. They are much lighter, which when you're talking about the bigger batteries is nice. I have a gel cell at 80 amp hours or 100 amp hours, almost 96, that weighs about 75 pounds. And I pick that because it's the biggest one I can pick up with one hand and put in my car without hurting myself. It's much easier to pick up that 25 pound 100 amp hour bioeno and put it wherever I need it. Much easier to transport. They are safe to transport, unlike a lithium ion battery of the kind that maybe blow up in people's pockets or start fires in their phones or when they're recharging their, uh, their batteries for their, uh, their model aircraft. <clears throat> These things do not have that. They have built-in battery management systems that will prevent over-discharging. They will prevent overcharging. They will make sure that the battery doesn't self-destruct. They have another advantage in that uh, compared to a typical gel cell, if you take an AGM or a gel and you discharge it all the way down, say down to 10 and a half volts, you're probably going to have a, maybe a, a few hundred of those charges at most, and then the battery is ready for recycling. The lithium iron phosphate batteries can be fully discharged maybe a couple of thousand times. So they have many, many more life cycles in them than the heavier but less expensive AGM and gels. So, I mean, the ones I have will probably outlive me given the frequency with which I use them. To me, that's worth it. And the combination of the higher voltage during its discharge cycle, the lower weight, the lack of any gassing, of course, like you'd have with a, a liquid or sloshy battery, and the uh, high number of discharge cycles that to me makes it worth it. Your mileage may vary, but just so you know. Commonly used batteries, the AGM type, DECA, Lifeline, Trojan are some of the names that you'll see. They make good, these, all, these are all good makers. They make good batteries, good quality batteries. They're, they're very robust. If you follow the manufacturer's directions, they'll last you a long time. For the lithium iron phosphate, there are some other makers out there. The only one I have experience with, and it's all been good, is BioNO. They're based in Santa Ana. And by the way, they have offered us ACS uh, special pricing, and that's 15% uh, off list. If you call and tell them you're a ham, you'll get 10% off. If you are use the ACS code, you'll get 15% off. It's a little extra incentive if you decide to go that way. And they're, they're very, very good. I mean, I had one, re I had one uh, charger that started going bad and they just basically sent me another one. I sent it in, they sent me another one, no problem. Now let's talk about connecting your radio and with its power source. All wire has loss and voltage drop. Loss means some of the power will go away as heat. If you ever look inside a toaster, you'll see some wire there. It's thin wire, it's typically nichrome wire. It's high resistance wire, it's thin, and what does it do? It heats up, that's how your toast gets toasted. That's fine for a toaster, but you certainly don't want it when you're trying to power a piece of equipment. To minimize the voltage drop, which is always bad because that's less voltage available for your radio, and the loss, which is uh, in heat, uh, you minimize them by making the wire as short as reasonable and as large as reasonable. For those of you not familiar with American wire gauges, when the number goes down, the size goes up. The standard is number 10. 10 gauge wire has a diameter of about one tenth of an inch. The gauge, as it goes every three steps up, the cross sectional area gets cut in half. Every three steps down, the cross sectional area doubles. The cross sectional area is basically like cross sectional area of a pipe when you're carrying water. The bigger the pipe, the more water can go through it, the less it resists. So you start with power leads that come with your radio. Now, often, if it's a mobile radio, you'll have like 14 feet of cable, and that's designed to put the radio in the trunk, and you power it from under the hood. Well, you don't necessarily need 14 feet. I almost never use that full length on my radios. 
I usually shorten them up to what I'm going to need for the installation, typically not more than five or six feet. Then if I need to run further, I will switch to a larger gauge wire and I will interconnect them with Anderson power poles, for example, which is fairly standard and we'll show that in a minute. So I will use 10 gauge, eight gauge, or even six gauge. My mobile radio has a pair of six gauge wires coming from under the hood into the passenger compartment. So the drop is pretty low there. On all batteries, uh, you have to be safe. Do not wear your disco chains and, and necklaces near uh, a battery where you've got two terminals sitting there. You don't want to short them. You don't want to use long blade screwdrivers, the kinds of anything that could possibly short those terminals because that means a lot of current flows in a really short period of time, and that's called an explosion. Never use flooded electrolyte batteries. Those are the kind, now even if they don't have the caps where you unscrew them and put water in, maybe they just have a little look through window that has a little eye in it that says, oh, this is okay. They're still flooded. They slosh around inside. Never use them indoors. Uh, I suggest you avoid them altogether. When they charge and when they discharge, there are chemical processes that result in the release of hydrogen gas. If you ever wonder what a collection of hydrogen gas will do, remember the Hindenburg. Don't use them. Whatever you decide to do in the way of combination of power and power supply and battery, you really shouldn't connect the battery directly to the output of your power supply and then run the radio. Because some power supplies have what they call a crowbar circuit or a safety circuit that in certain fault situations, it puts a short across the output. Well, if you have a battery across the output, you're shorting the battery. That's the very thing you don't want to do. Why would you have those two connected together? Well, it's kind of, you know, if the power goes out, the battery takes over and I don't even have to reach down and do anything. Frankly, I don't mind reaching down and unplugging one thing and plugging in another, or you can put in a heavy duty switch. There are all sorts of ways to do it. You don't have to have them connected directly, but if you do so that the battery automatically takes over, you need some sort of isolation device, uh, typically called a power gate. Here are a couple. Uh, the one on the left is, I think, West Mountain Radio. The one on the right is from a guy in the Midwest, KI0BK. He's a ham. Uh, this one can handle about 25 amps maximum. This one can handle, I think, 40 or 45 amps. For a mobile radio, this one on the right is perfectly good. And I think the cost is around 50 or 60 bucks, which is much less than this one over here. If you're going to connect both the battery and this one, in each case, you put the battery on one terminal, you get the power supply on another terminal, and you put your load on the third terminal. Whichever one is supplying more voltage at the time, that's the one that runs the load. It can be really convenient. As I say, I, I don't mind at my main station. I just reach over and you know switch from one to the other if I have to. You ask about these little square terminals here. Those are the power poles I was mentioning earlier. They're made by a company called Anderson. They have become kind of a de facto standard. You don't have to use them. Uh, what they do is they allow connecting and disconnecting different loads and different supply sources fairly quickly. They also allow, if you bring your uh, radio or your supply to uh, an EOC or a field day or some other place where other people are operating, it makes your power sources and your radio connections rather interchangeable. It's convenient for a variety of sources. These are genderless connectors. You use the same connector body and the same contact for the source end and for the load end. So you don't have to keep a separate set for the power supplies and a separate set for your radios, the same ones, and you just, you configure them uh, in a way that you'll see, I think, in our book 73 and a variety of other sources, so that whichever you have, you put them on all the same way, they will automatically mate the right way when you put a supply and load together. If you don't have the crimper necessary to put power, power poles on properly, there are a number of ACS members who will help. I know John AC6VV and Dan NR6V, Bill WA6SW, myself, we've all helped people put power poles on. We all have the proper crimping tools, and so we can help you set up your gear that way if you want to do that. And, and these aren't expensive. They typically, each pair of connectors are red and a black. It runs about a buck, not a big deal. And they come in several different contact sizes based on the size of wire you're using. They all use the same housing size, which means they are all interchangeable. If you have a 15 amp contact on a little uh, LED light and you have a 45 amp outlet, they work the same. You just plug one into the other. It's no problem. I think that's it. Let's see if there are any questions, and I'm going to undo my screen for now. There's kind of two questions that are in the chat. One is, where do you get the K10BK power gate? 
the KI0BK, that's a call sign. He advertises in QST. Uh, if you don't find it, somebody contact me and I'll dig it up for you. Do you have like a, a basic pick list for a basic system? Well, in, in terms of, yeah, I mean, I, I would, I mean, if I were designing something from, from the start, uh, I would find the biggest Astron power supply I could and put it under my desk. I'd get some uh, number 10 gauge uh, zip cord. I'd outfit it with power poles. I'd run it up to uh, the uh, radio and power poles at the radio end as well. Plug in your antenna and you're ready to roll. Yeah, I think that um, kind of more of like, uh, you know, this is kind of one of those things where you come in and you say, gee, I want to get a radio and I want to get online, you go out and you buy a uh, handheld. And then the next thing is, is you go out and you say, okay, I'm going to set up my radio uh, shack. So, you know, um, I asked for advice on that before and it kind of came back as the Kenwood B71A is a great radio. The mm -hmm. Comet GP1 is a good antenna. And I got that Samplex power supply. Samplex. And, mm -hmm. Yeah. And now I'm off to the races. I have my three pieces of the puzzle. Okay, and and there's variations on each of those. For example, you got the GP1, which is a fairly short, easy to handle, uh, dual band antenna. The GP3 is about five feet tall, but it's got more gain. You remember at the last session we talked about antenna gain, having more of your signal go toward the horizon and less up at the useless, you know, up in the air and and down toward the ground. Uh, uh, then the GP9 is even taller. And that puts even more of your signal out toward the horizon and less of it in the useless directions. Right. And then, yeah. and so on. So uh, there are different flavors and I, you know, I don't know what somebody's budget and, and physical configuration will allow, but uh, I would say if you can afford and have room to put a higher gain antenna, do it. Uh, if you can manage to use a good, low loss, either hard line or at worst uh, uh, LMR 400 uh, and keep that run fairly, you know, not too long, uh, do it. Uh, if you can get a 35 amp supply instead of a 20 amp supply, do it. As far as you know, you're talking about basically having a, a station that you can pick up and take with you on a deployment, right? Yeah, that's that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah having it in the house, you don't really need the, the go kit with everything in one box. I mean, you can sit it on a desk or in a, in a little console or a, you know, a corner of your cabinet or something. Uh, and <clears throat> if you're using fairly good size wire, you can put the power supply out of the way, you know, down under the desk or behind it or something where it's, it's not, it's not occupying, you know, useful space. And uh, you can keep it, fairly unobtrusive from a visual standpoint. If I need to be portable, generally I'll have my Forerunner with me and I have, I have two radios in there, multiple antennas. I've got uh, power sources and I can throw in additional power sources. I can throw in those, those BioNO big 100 amp hour batteries and I can run off the house battery. I can run off the BioNO. Um, I can throw in an AC supply and an extension cord and I can run off that if there's AC power somewhere. So that's kind of my go kit. It has four wheels. Um, the, the design of any station really depends on what it is you're trying to accomplish with it. As I say, the, there are kind of competing interests with uh, minimal visual impact, uh, operating flexibility, portability. Uh, you have to decide what works best for you. Uh, and, but I would say if you have you know, good basic supply, good basic radio, and a good battery, uh, you can mix and match those to meet a variety of needs. So I have one of the, uh, I run my radios off the batteries, and it's one of the big lead acid batteries. Mm -hmm. Should I let that battery run its complete cycle, or should I top it off on a regular basis? Um, any battery will last longer if you don't deep cycle it. Meaning? Meaning if you, if, you, if you top it off every time, uh, you won't be drawing it down as far and you won't be shortening its life as much. Mm -hmm. The shortest life of a battery is when you take it all the way down to full discharge over okay. and over and over again. Okay. okay. Now, again, on the BioNO, you can do that a thousand or two thousand times, but any other, any lead acid battery, whether it's AGM, gel, or, or heaven forfend flooded, uh, 
you will shorten the life of that thing. The flooded ones, you'll, you'll shorten their life really fast. Okay, and would you also recommend a meter to gauge the uh, power coming out of the battery? Um, I don't because, you know, when if I'm going to run out. it for a period of time, I mean, it works until it doesn't. In the right. case of the BioNO, I don't worry about running it out of charge. When it, you know, if I'm out for a weekend or up on a mountaintop for a weekend running a bunch of microwave radios and liaison radios and everything else, mm -hmm. uh, I've got two of those 100 amp hour choppers and I leave one hooked on and, and when it starts to croak, I hook up the other one. Right. So you can use a simple voltage meter knowing where your battery is in its discharge cycle or charge cycle and get an idea whether it's doing okay or not. Great, thank you, Marty. What about uh, other fusing points So, what you would recommend? Okay, well, I guess an ADU is kind of an RF equivalent of a fuse uh, to some yeah. extent, So, uh, it, but it's not technically a fuse. Um, where, you, where you want to fuse uh, something, first, the radios all have fuses built into them. They're usually inside somewhere where it's really inconvenient to get, but it's also really hard to blow them because uh, it's hard to do anything to the radio that would, that would blow the fuse. Uh, but there's something called a system fuse. The system fuse is designed to protect the entire system, not the radio. And the best example I can give of that is, let's assume you have a couple, a, a, a pair of uh, leads clipped to your battery under your hood. And just for testing, you're running it uh, into your radio. And all of a sudden, somebody says, oh, he left his car hood open. They slam the hood shut and the, and the edge of the hood cuts the insulation on the cables and it puts a dead short across the battery, okay? That's a pr something you want to protect against. That would be a system fuse and you put the system fuse as close to the power source as possible. If you have a big bank of deep cycle batteries, it's probably a good idea to have a fuse somewhere near the battery, at least in one lead. Uh, the, uh, uh, an automotive fuse, uh, may be okay, but for that job, I use the same thing I use under the hood of my car, and that is a class T, T for tango, fuse. A class T fuse is much physically bigger than uh, your typical automotive fuse, and it has a big holder, and the holders are customized size to the, to the capacity of the fuse. But the, the, the class T fuse has two ratings. Uh, it has the rating at which it will blow, uh, given enough time. In my case, it's 120 amps, because I'm never going to draw that much, um, except in an accident. And the other is the amp interrupt capacity. And that is, if a short happens, how much current is flowing, and uh, uh, you don't want the, the broken parts of the fuse arcing together. I mean, that's an arc welder, right? You know, 24 volts at a couple of hundred amps with an eighth inch spacing, there's an arc welder. Well, you don't want that happening. So the class T fuse has arc squelching powder inside it. And so that amp interrupt capacity says, hey, even if you start a spark and draw drawing thousands of amps, I can put it out right away and prevent that explosion. So if I do anything stupid like short the thing out, uh, I may blow the fuse, but I won't, I won't short the battery. I just wanted to say on uh, Anderson power poles, there are a lot of Chinese knockoffs out oh, there, particularly yeah. on Amazon, and they do they look identical, but they don't work well. You get intermittent contacts. So buy yours from a dealer like PowerWorks that carries genuine Anderson products. Thank you, Dan. Good uh, absolutely them, point. Yeah, I second that because when I first joined, Marty gave me that exact advice, and I did spend the extra money and I got the good power pole. Uh, connector and uh, all the the stuff he's recommending and it worked perfectly and the right tool works really great. Let me mention the tools too. Uh, John, are you using the uh, the West Mountain crimper? Uh, it's the PowerWorks. PowerWorks crimper. Okay. Yeah. Those are okay. Those are pretty good for most of them, but I found on the 45 amp contacts when I'm working with bigger wire, they would jam in there and it was always a mess. So I splurged and I bought the genuine Anderson crimper. It's a lot more expensive. It's about 150 bucks. But mm -hmm. for, the, for the bigger contacts, it does a clean job and doesn't get them stuck in damn. I had, I had to throw away a bunch of these things 
uh, in trying to use that, uh, af that aftermarket crimper on those things. So uh, if you ever find yourself needing to do the 45 amp connectors, which means you're using like number 10 or eight wire, um, uh, see me and we'll, we'll get you to use the proper tool. Thank you very much, everybody, for uh, you know participating today. We had a lot of folks. Uh, Twenty-five, I think, was our peak. Hank, thank you so much, and thanks everybody for being here. And thanks, Marty. A reminder, you thanks, know, when Marty. you have questions, uh, you can always catch us offline. Uh, catch myself or Dan or any of the others who've done a lot of this. We're happy to try and answer the questions for you.